I thought that um, <laughs> I thought that I'd uh, read you some suttas, so I brought my phone, and people decided to text. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, if I was your unfriendly person then, or your difficult person then, I got extra meta. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good idea. If you irritate somebody, then teach loving kindness on the difficult person. (laughs) (laughs) Then you get more meta. Mm. (laughs) Anyway, that's not really uh, the topic. The topic is love and wisdom and how love can be a means to insight and a result. It's always both ways in Buddhism. Whatever we practice can lead towards wisdom, but also wisdom is the result of the practice. Or is it the other way around? Anyway, sure I'll get it mixed up. (laughs) So I did want to talk today a bit about how uh, love, the practice of metta bhavana, metta meditation, can help with insight. The kind of insights that can come up and also... um, and also, how far the metta can take us on the path. Because some people, I used to think that metta was just something you do afterwards and it's kind of a bit of a feel-good thing. Uh, but it's not the real practice, it's not the deep stuff, it's not particular part and dependent origination and all this stuff. And Sometimes there's this cliche in the monastic world that nuns are good for teaching metta, <laughs> doing social work, you know, counselling, teaching children, and all that, because maybe women have that stereotypical, um, you know, there are stereotypes around us being maybe more emotionally engaged or warm or empathic or something like that, which is a generalisation, of course. It's actually a lot to do with um, oestrogen. I learned that from a transgender friend who started taking oestrogen and uh, feeling really lovey-dovey. It was really cute. (laughs) It's really interesting to see that what we take as gender is often physiological and again conditioned. But anyway, metta is not uh, a beginner's practice or something, you know, saturine and and sort of uh, sweet but without substance, it's actually helping us understand what real happiness is and there's a very deep wisdom embedded within it. So I want to talk about how really love isn't love without that wisdom because a real deep understanding of the way things are engenders genuine love, the love that is sustaining and that doesn't change according to conditions that we impose on others and that we impose on life and also how wisdom isn't really wisdom without a great measure of love without measureless love I mean it's to me quite off-putting to hear people uh, speak very high truths maybe write books that sound great and they talk about the classic insight stages that are taught in, in Theravada Buddhism but then they behave in ways that are kind of reprehensible and not worthy of even ordinary people um, who haven't practiced. You know, sometimes the sila is lacking, the ethics, the basic virtue isn't there. And you can know that when that's the case, the wisdom isn't deep. It isn't real wisdom because it hasn't liberated the heart from suffering. This is not a judgment, but if someone still gets angry, they still have the defilements of the mind. They still have afflictive emotions that are causing them and others harm. And real wisdom frees the heart from those afflictive emotions. It frees the heart from suffering and it leads to deep inner peace. And the Buddha was always designated as the great compassionate one. That was his epithet. Is that right? Epithet? Epithet? That was his designation. It was his name. Um, and that was because he had this very deep insight into suffering, the causes of suffering, and the way to eradicate those causes. And as a result, his whole life was aligned with the path. Everything he did, he did motivated by loving kindness and compassion. 
for the welfare and happiness, the true welfare and happiness of all beings, whoever they were. Yeah, the only people you didn't really teach were people that just couldn't, they just weren't ready to hear the Dhamma. But that didn't stop him from trying. He wasn't proselytizing, he wasn't a missionary, but he would direct his mind to where beings could hear the Dhamma and benefit, and he spent his whole life doing that. Apparently the reason that um, a Buddha has to be asked to teach is because once they um, realize the deepest truth and they experience Nibbāna, there isn't any selfishness that leads to a sense of will or needing or wanting to do anything. So they have to be kind of... Um, there has to be... It's not about who asks them, but there has to be like a, a kind of... Um, how do you say? Like a, a nudge or a, a, a kind of cue for them to teach. And the only thing that motivates that is the four Brahma Viharas. Metta, compassion, karuna, mudita, and upekka. And within those Brahma Viharas is wisdom because it's an appropriate response. Another example for how those Brahma Viharas work is like um, I said it's love's response to suffering. Compassion is love's response to suffering. But you can also um, think of it like the way a mother loves four different children. So the mother loves uh, the little one with a feeling of metta. She wants to make sure it's well and grows up nicely. So there's this feeling of may you be well, may you thrive, may you flourish. And then um, she has another child that gets sick or maybe the same child gets sick at times. And then her thoughts of loving kindness change to may you be free from your sickness, may you be well, may you recover. And this is like compassion. So it's connected with that person's uh, that person in a suffering state. And then uh, when the child uh, grows up and starts to bloom and blossom and have success, make friends, do well at school or at university, then she has a feeling of mudita. She's rejoicing with the child. It's a kind of celebratory type of love that gives her a lot of happiness, or him. The father feels these things as well, I'm sure, maybe the siblings. And then the last case is, is when the child's left home, they've become an adult, they've you know, kind of decided on their path, and, and they might go a long way away to India or to Burma, and where there's no telegraph office, there's like one in the whole country when I was there in Delhi. Maybe one in Bombay, but that's like another planet like a 24, 30 hour journey from where I was. <laughs> so I'd have to travel 18 hours to get to this one telegraph office to send a little message, you know, and uh, it must have been so hard. But anyway, I'm sure my mum developed a lot of equanimity at that time. Mm. Probably a lot of worry as well. <laughs> but it's the equanimity of uh, a mother, you know, a mother who's let go and who is... Um, understands that the child has to take their own path and they're going to go through ups and downs, then the feeling of love turns into equanimity. It's not cold. They're still there. They still care. But there's a little bit of distance and perspective because you can only uh, <coughs> do so much and a person has to follow their path, their own karma in life. So this is one way that um, we, love has this innate wisdom within it. And... Um, of course, uh, the wisdom without love is not wisdom. All the great teachers, the people that we're drawn to, we're drawn to them because of their sense of virtue. There's a sense of safety and trust that we feel around them. There's a sense that, yeah, their virtue is, is uh, purer than ours. There's something there to aspire to. There's some qualities that we admire. you know. And uh, one of the strongest qualities is love and kindness. There was a monk in Thailand. He's actually Ajahn Chah's nephew, but I think it must be one or two removed, I'm not quite sure. He looks quite like Ajahn Chah, though. And uh, one day Ajahn Chah went to the monks after the um, Ains retreats, the three-month annual retreat, and he said, so, anybody here who doesn't have any defilements anymore? Uh, how about you? How about you? How about you? <laughs> and everyone's like, ooh, I, I still have plenty of, uh, well, let's call them afflictive tendencies, greed, hate, and delusion. Uh, things that make us suffer. And then he got to this one monk and he said, no, I don't have any left. So Ajahn Chah said, okay, come to my room, you know, and everyone thought, oh, he's going to be in trouble, what's going to happen now? 
And uh, and Ajahn Chah questioned him, and no one was else was there. I'm sure they were all like, "What's happening?" But uh, when he came back down, they asked him what had happened. He said, "Oh, Ajahn Chah just told me to develop loving kindness. Now that's my that's my job now. So even after deep insight, we can generate love." And it's nice when we look in the suttas at where and how the Buddha teachers met her, because sometimes, uh, quite often, in the gradual training, it's what's called, it's, it's kind of a parallel teaching the, to the Eightfold Path, but the gradual training goes in more detail. And it usually starts with hearing the Dhamma and developing confidence in the teachings. And that will naturally lead us to wanting to live a virtuous life, having the confidence, the courage, the understanding that that's in our own best interest and then refining that virtue even more into <clears throat> qualities like contentment and simplicity contented with little food contented with your robes your bowl wherever you um, live and a sense of wakefulness and then mindfulness so the mindfulness starts but usually from preliminary mindfulness the training then goes into developing deep samadhi and metta is one of the ways to do that. So developing um, samadhi through loving kindness or through breath meditation, which is very common in the Buddhist text. And as a result of that, wisdom has a chance to grow because when we develop these uh, deep meditations, we have a chance to see things as they are because greed and hate and delusion are not influencing our perception. They're not um, blinding us to the truth. The Buddha called these hindrances obscurations that weaken wisdom and that nourish delusion. So they're kind of the food for distorting our reality. You can see that yourself when you're angry. You know, everything looks kind of red and horrible. I remember in Burma when um, I had a teacher that I revered very deeply, the same way I do Ajahn Brahm. I've been very blessed with my teachers. Um, and it was in the Goenka tradition where there's quite a strict and um, systematic technique. And I'd done a lot of long retreats, which you get a lot more freedom to practice with the uh, teachings in your own way, I suppose. But, I mean, everyone has their own way of relating to the path always, even if it's the same method. But here he gave an instruction I'd never heard before that's given on the 60-day retreats. And uh, I think only Vipassana teachers can do those, so I wasn't yet appointed. Normally they like you to get married and then they appoint you. I didn't want to get married, so they didn't appoint me. (laughs) I think that would have been the key. Um, But it's for good reason. It's usually because they want you to be the completely celibate or in a committed relationship. Uh, And, yeah, when you're still young, there's always a chance, you know. (laughs) Even when you're old. But anyway... So this instruction came up during the retreat that was something I hadn't heard. And I remember feeling like this sense of, oh, should he be teaching this? You know, even though he's like, actually, at least the first stage of enlightenment, I still felt like, oh, this is different, you know, maybe something might go wrong. And I remember having the perception that suddenly everything turned red, like the beautiful green paddy fields and the hills and everything that looked soft and so welcoming before suddenly looked kind of menacing and threatening because my mind was full of a kind of fear and a sense of irritation that he'd taught this thing that he shouldn't have done. <laughs> According to me. <laughs> of course that passed and then I realised that I'm just very privileged to be learning from someone who really knows these teachings at a depth and... Um, Of course, as monastics, we we are, in a sense, qualified to teach. So um, once that subsided, again, everything looked very green, and, you know, the sunshine was beautiful. It was like the davas were hanging in the air. (laughs) But just at that time, you know, it felt like uh, something went wrong. So we have these uh, hindrances that distort the reality completely, and so we can't really see the truth. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how um, how the metta uh, leads to samadhi, but also how that samadhi leads to wisdom. And that's one of the reasons I bought my phone, because there's a very beautiful sutta called Volition. And for those who are sutta buffs, it's in the Anguttara Nikaya number um, 10.2. 10 means there are 10 
factors to it. So that's easy to remember. And it's a very beautiful teaching because it talks about the path as a natural process. And uh, in this particular sutta, it starts from virtue and non-remorse. So you can see already virtue and non-remorse is an aspect of metta. It's a, a gift of metta to the world. You know, motivated by loving kindness, we simply can't do things that hurt and harm. So the Buddha says here that this is how this whole process, from suffering, actually, to happiness and freedom, begins. So he says that one who is virtuous and whose behavior is virtuous does not need to assert the volition, let non-regret arise in me. It's natural that non-regret arises in a virtuous person, one whose behavior is virtuous. So you can already see how suffering is being undermined, because if we live a beautiful life, we feel good about ourselves, we have a sense of wholesome happiness in our hearts, and then we don't go to sleep thinking, oh no, did I do this, I shouldn't have said that, you know, next time I'll have to do better, that's okay, you know, we make mistakes, we can forgive ourselves, but non-regret does not arise because we know we're doing our best. And from there... For one without regret, no volition need be exerted. Let joy arise in me. Shh, phone. It's natural that joy arises in one without regret. And sometimes these joys are subtle, right? You don't think, oh, it's joyful to have non-regret. You just presume that's normal. But compared to actually having a lot of remorse and regret, you know, thinking about that politician again, (laughs) who I will not mention, I mean, they cannot be feeling happiness because they must know that their life is generating a lot of ill will, a lot of conflict and division. It's not only one. I mean, so many things are happening in the world and people are creating wars and having anger towards particular religious or ethnic groups of people. And how can there be joy in their hearts? It's, it's simply impossible if you have a happy heart, a joyful heart, a peaceful heart, to think about destroying another. We know that for ourselves. So I think it's really important to reflect on this and to understand that there's a beauty and there's a peace, there's a um, sense of a clear conscience and a joy to that. It's joyful to have a clear conscience. So joy arises, and this is called pamoja in Pali, and it's the kind of joy that comes also through loving kindness, you know, through... Reflecting on one's own goodness, that's a way to bring up joy. Um, Getting inspired by the teachings is a way to bring up joy. Um, There's so many ways to bring up joy, but non-remorse is one. And then um, the Buddha says, for one who is joyful, you don't need to exert a volition. In other words, you don't need to make any effort thinking, let rapture arise. That's piti, the kind of joy we feel in meditation. It's natural that joy, uh, sorry, it's natural that a rapture or piti arises in one who is joyful. So first it might start as the joy of just being here, practicing meditation, having a lovely community to share with. And then after a while that, that turns into rapture. We sit down and we really soak it in and it starts to come up from inside, from inside the mind. And that starts to become a really powerful, um, a powerful way to deepen the practice. The meditation just starts to deepen on its own from there because it's easy to stay with a mind state or even a body that feels pleasure. It's very easy to be with that and to stay. And these two qualities, the joy and the rapture, are really special qualities of loving kindness. The loving kindness can get you to this point in the samadhi sequence the sequence towards tranquilizing the mind, more quickly usually than anapana. Not necessarily more powerful, but it can come up more quickly. Um, And it can be co-joined with the breath, of course. So then from here, the Buddha says, for one with a, a mind with piti, no volition or will needs to be exerted, no effort at all. Let my body be tranquil. It's natural that the body of one with a rapturous mind is tranquil. And this is Bhante Sujato's translation. I've not read before that it says, let my body be tranquil. I think often it's just, 
let me experience tranquility because but with the body becoming tranquil the mind does become tranquil too the two kind of go together kaya and chitta pasadi so this is where the pt that many of you have experienced starts to become quieter somebody experienced so they experience different flavors of pt like different flavors of i don't know different types of music maybe or different types of chocolate or tea <laughs> some are more stimulating some are more calming and mellow so here it's almost like we we soak in our fill we take in our fill and then the body and the mind feel really satisfied with the pt to the point that it sometimes becomes a little bit too much and then the mind naturally moves into a more tranquil kind of happiness which is called the pasadi the the tranquility it's a quieter kind of joy and from there for one who is tranquil no volition need to be exerted let me feel pleasure that's sukha it's natural for one who is tranquil to feel pleasure and for me the word sukha it can mean pleasure but i like how ajahn brahms put a spin or maybe it's shala katherine she's another of my teachers she teaches jhanas and she's very wise she's a lay woman but um, her meditation's very deep and uh and she likes to translate sukha as contentment which i think is great because it's not the kind of happiness that needs anything more it's the kind of happiness that's actually very satiating very fulfilling and it is enough even more than enough it really satisfies the mind so the buddha likens that to um being in the desert and coming i think the tranquility he says it's like being in a desert and coming across a tree that you can um find shade under and you just rest there but then the the pleasure the sukha or the contentment is like there's a pool and you're boiling hot and you just plunge into that pool and ah it's so refreshing and so satisfying you feel completely resourced so then it's interesting here because the next thing that happens is that one feeling pleasure or contentment a kind of inner happiness um doesn't need to think or exert the effort or will let my mind be stilled it's natural that the mind of one feeling pleasure or happiness is still and the word bhante sujata has translated this as concentrated which is just awful sorry bhante he's mm-hmm. my friend but he should know better because he's one of our jambam students <laughs> it's really not a feeling like something's getting concentrated i mean you could say the mental and physical factors are coming together you could say it's a kind of unity a kind of stability of mind but it's also a stilling and i think that's a much more beautiful translation because stillness is something that you can feel more than something you do and stillness is much more inclusive in a way um the whole path into these deep states of meditation is one of letting go it's one of stilling the will as it says here you don't need to exert will you don't need to try it's more about putting the causes in place letting the sense of self get out of the way and as a result of letting go and letting the process happen through putting causes in place the mind naturally finds its stillness it finds that deep um in a abiding and this is the state of the of jhana deep meditation so this is the point where there are no hindrances left at all and it's interesting to notice that the proximate cause for that deep meditation is the happiness it is the pleasure so this tells you how metta can be a part of that process but also um once we do uh, experience those deep meditations there's no more ill will in the mind at that time it's only temporary but for so long as that persists and also for some time afterwards there's no more ill will and as a result of that we have a chance to see things as they are so this is how the uh, deep meditation leads to wisdom so here the buddha says for one who is still in mind in other words one who has this uh, deep samadhi samadham samadham chittam when the mind becomes still um you don't need to have the volition let me know and see things as they really are it is natural for one who has experienced jhana let's say knows and sees things as they really are 
And here it's important to put a little caveat in and to say that you aren't going to always immediately see things as they are, but the point is you've got a chance. It's like uh, until now the mind's been stirred up like a pool of water that has these really choppy waves on top. And because of that, you look down into the water, you can't actually see your reflection. You can't see what's deep inside that pond or that lake. You can't see to the bottom. There could be fish, there could be crocodiles. I don't know, if it's Australia, there could be salt crocod- saltwater crocodiles or freshwater crocodiles, or there could be, I don't know, all kinds of things in there. But you can't see because the mind's stirred up. And the stillness is like the lake becoming clear, lake becoming still. So it's just like glass. I once saw this actually on the sea, on this train coming to um, to the bar. Actually, I was going to Gaia House, but it comes through uh, on the same route from London or from Oxford. And it was a night where the sun had gone down and the moon had come up and the water, the sea, was completely still like glass. It was like a a kind of dark turquoise and then the sky was like indigo and there was this white moon. It was the most stunning thing I've seen for one of those times that I just got quite high on the beauty of it. Almost like a deep meditation, but not quite. (laughs) And you could just see the perfect reflection of the moon. It was so stunning. So it's similar, you know, you then can see whatever's reflected on that mind very, very clearly and also you can see deep inside right to the bottom of the water to all the little things that are going on so we can start to see like where suffering arises we can see things like impermanence we can see that there's actually no self inside whatever we take to be a self it's not that there's nothing there but it isn't actually um unchanging it's not an essence of a being it's actually completely conditioned you know, we can break it down into components of existence. You know, basically the Buddha described this entity that we take to be a self as comprised of body, physicality, materiality, um, feeling, the sensations, the feelings, the emotions, the aspect of pleasure, pain, and somewhere in between. Anything that's that's felt with the body or mind, and then perception. And meta certainly shows you how unreliable and changeable perception is. One day you see someone one way, the next day when you have meta in your mind you see them as a friend. <laughs> and that can change within instants, can't it? Depending on your mood. And then sankara, which is like um, conditioned reactions or volitional reaction or will. Um, it's our reactive part of the mind, you know. Feel happiness perceive it as good, react with, I want more. Yeah, or you have a body, you feel pain. So the body, feeling is the pain. And then the perception is, I don't want this. Or this is pain. Even just this is pain is a perception. And then a reaction. Something's gone wrong. I don't like it. I've got to move. You know, my body's terrible. Everyone else's body's okay. (laughs) And suffering as a result. And then lastly, the consciousness that's aware of all of this. And even that consciousness is actually not one thing. Sometimes people translate vinyana as consciousness, but it means consciousnesses. So there's eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. So there's six types of consciousness. And they too are changing all the time. So we start to see what's really going on. It's like the mental apparatus, physical and mental, and how they interrelate to each other, how they constantly condition each other, Um, and also how they're subject to change, subject to dissolution. And as a result of that, they're suffering. The Buddha speaks about this in the Anattalakana Sutta, which is a very powerful sutta that he gave, a teaching that he gave to um, his first five friends, And uh, it was the second teaching he gave after his enlightenment that caused them to have full liberation. In the first teaching he gave, one of them attained the first stage, but in the second teaching on non-self, going through all these different aspects of what we take to be a self, all of them became fully liberated from suffering and from delusion. And in that um, sutta he says, you know, is any of this um, permanent? 
You know, is your body permanent? Is your feeling permanent? And the monk said, no, it's not permanent. Well then, whatever's not permanent, can this really be a source of happiness? Or is it suffering? It's suffering, they all realised. And what's suffering? Can that be a self? Can that really be a self? If it is a self, what's the point of a self? (laughs) If it's just suffering? And they said, no, that can't be a self. So they realised the truth of non-self based on these deep states of meditation based on having no hindrances present there. And most people, for most people I'd say, the main hindrance that we struggle with is is ill will, is aversion. Um, Even craving is a kind of aversion, right? Because it's craving for something better. We don't like what we have, so we want something more. We're averse to, to what we have, so we crave to change it. Or sometimes we even crave not to be. There's this craving called the craving not to be which is a a stronger version that can lead to things like suicide. We don't want to be, and we think that's going to solve the problem, but of course it it never does. So the point here also is, as I said in one of the first talks, um, metta is a really powerful way into the deep states of meditation. It's a really pleasant way in. Of course, they're going to be naturally pleasant, but it has this quality of um, really resourcing the mind so that the mind is very, very soft and full of well-being and ease. And so when we experience these uh, deeper truths, they don't actually break us. They just break the suffering. They just break the delusion. Um, We actually realize it's a relief to let those things we were holding on to as a source of happiness, it's a relief to let them go. Because you're not letting them go and having nothing left. You're having this beautiful meta left instead. You know, you're having this heart so wide and expansive, so full of love, that you don't want to hold on to something inferior. So this is not... I'm going quite deep here because this is a talk about love and wisdom. (laughs) And I have to talk about the Buddha's insights. But... The point is there's nothing to fear when you have a mind of loving kindness. Loving kindness overcomes the fear long before you experience these things. And so there's a very open mind towards um, the insights that can arise. And they will basically just uproot the greed and the aversion, the ill will from the mind for good. So if you think it's pleasurable to have a little bit less hate and <laughs> ill will in your mind and you're already experiencing bliss, imagine what it's like when it's never there. It's, it's gone. <laughs> you know, of course, you can relate to everybody with love, with kindness, as though they are a friend. But it doesn't stop there. So we have a chance to see things as they are. And then the next step is that One becomes, here the um, translation is disenchanted and dispassionate, (laughs) but um, Arjun Brown and me as well would prefer something like Nibida, which he's translated as disenchantment, literally means being repelled from what we formerly took to be a source of happiness. We're actually diverted away from it in no uncertain terms. It's like we realise it's a hot coal and we just drop it. And this is instinctive because we have something else much more beautiful. So it's like, of course, you drop what's inferior to pick up what's beautiful. And uh, and dispassion really means things start to fade. So the suffering fades. Yeah. Once we let go of something, it fades from our awareness. It's like if there's a bad thought or a thought that's really bothering you and you see it as an affliction, you let it go. You drop it, and because you drop it, it it literally fades, it disappears from your mind. And because of this, he says next that there's no need um, for one who, let's have a look, for one who um, has this this, uh, turning away and letting things go, let's say, watching things fade away, there's no need to have the volition may I have the knowledge and view of liberation. It's natural that one will have the knowledge of liberation. So that's what's left. 
if all this happens and the other things fade away, you basically become completely free and liberated in mind. But getting back, maybe, <laughs> from this really deep stuff that we may think is beyond us at this time, I did want to talk a little bit about how metta can uh, show us the conditioned nature of perception in a very beautiful, very easy way if we only take time to reflect. And you might have noticed already that when you have a mind of love and kindness, uh, it starts to affect the way we view other people. One of the ways you can see this is um, if you're practicing for a long time with the different categories is that those categories change. So somebody that you had in the category of the neutral person who was a stranger starts to feel more like a friend because you start to give them more attention and see their humanity and consider their life a little bit and generate these good feelings. So when you think of them, it's associated with a sense of loving kindness. And you might find that when you actually meet these people, you have a lot more receptivity. You have, oh, it's like, oh, hi. <laughs> you know, they, they become familiar to you. And as a result, they, they respond in kind. And so the categories change. It's also possible, of course, that um, people who were once friends change and become the difficult people. Um, it can happen so easily. Someone who's your friend one moment, if you have a mind of loving kindness towards them, you see all their qualities, you sing their praises. But even with my teacher, if he tells a sexist joke, which he does do, um, <laughs> you know, at that time I can be quite irritated. If If like everything else is wonderful and there's a really good kind of, I don't know, there's a lot of wonderful things happening, say, on a tour and uh, he just drops one in and it's kind of funny. And But if I'm in his monastery and there's already a little bit of, oh, we don't really like the bikinis going in line, not from him but from some other monks, you know, some of them don't like the fact that we do go according to our reigns, so according to seniority, unlike many monasteries where the women just naturally go behind. <laughs> in Perth, they actually go according to the seniority, so there's no gender discrimination. But some monks don't like that. So if I've had a hard day and I've felt a bit of passive aggression or, or worse, <laughs> and then Ajahn tells a sexist joke, I'm really upset with that. And it's like the whole place looks like not very friendly and, oh, these institutions, I'm fed up with them and... You know, and suddenly even the revered person who's actually a totally an ally and totally sacrificed himself for the sake of gender equity in, uh, in Buddhism suddenly becomes slightly l less shiny in my eyes, you know? <laughs> it's very interesting to see that, that it's our mind that creates others, that creates the world. And, uh, and yeah, sometimes we just wake up on the wrong side of bed. <laughs> We haven't had a good sleep, and because we haven't had a good sleep, the person who's usually you know, very dear to us just irritates us so much. So is that really the person that's the problem, or is it our state of mind? Maybe it's not even a problem, right? But if we react to them then as, a, as a, an enemy or somebody that's out there just to irritate us, then they do obviously start to get quite agitated as well and behave the way we expect them to, which is not very kindly in return. <laughs> and there's also this uh, beautiful experience when you practice a lot of metta that uh, it starts to change your relationship to the past. Yeah. Sometimes when we're struggling in life, when we're, we don't have much energy, someone here mentioned a viral infection, I had a burnout a couple of years ago, I understand then we look at our life and we think, why did I do this to myself? How could it have gone this way? You know, I should have done something different. Maybe I shouldn't have lived in Asia for so long. Or, <laughs> you know, I should never have taken on a project like of this magnitude because it's just burning me out. And everything looks kind of negative. But then when we have a mind of loving kindness and we feel like our lives are so full of goodness and we're attracting so many wonderful people around us and... You know, there's just so much to share. It doesn't matter if we feel tired. We just see our lives as generally good, generally going on the right track, and even full of blessings. You know, we can have so much gratitude arising for the smallest of things because the mind has loving kindness. 
And it's the same with the future, right? If you have a, a kind of fault-finding mind towards now, and then you just project that into the future, you just get a lot of anxiety and dread coming up. And you can only imagine a whole scenario of things going wrong. I notice that a lot if I have a bit of anxiety. It's like, oh, we might get this property and then it'll be so expensive to maintain and no one will come and I'll be stuck on this hill all on my own. And in the past, I could go to the city and I could get food deliveries and now I've got this big place to manage all on my own. And <laughs> you know, But then if I have a mind of loving kindness and feeling resourced, then I look at the future with really optimism in my mind you know lots of positivity and optimism wow I get this big place and then that means all these good people can come and have the opportunity to live with the monastics and to practice the eightfold path I'll have more spiritual friends there'll be opportunities for women to ordain and you know it's a beautiful location a bit outside the city much more peaceful and quiet right <laughs> so the whole Attitude changes, and because of that, you actually create your future because you see more opportunities and you're more able to to embrace those opportunities without fear but with a sense of hope and a sense of positivity to what might happen. So this is how loving-kindness can really change our world. And there was a study done, actually, to show that um, when people experience more pain in their body at the end of life, they would ask them, they would ask various people in this hospital wherever the study was being done, um, how they viewed their life in general. And they found that the people who experienced more pain towards the end generally viewed their life as more negative than the people who might have actually had a lot more trouble and turmoil in their life but were now feeling happiness and less pain. So it, this is not to scare us, but it's just to point out that... Um, the way we choose to remember can, or the way we um, interpret our experience really has an effect on our state of mind. And our state of mind has an effect on how we interpret our experience. So because of that, it helps us not to believe in our thoughts so much. You know, our thoughts about other people, our thoughts about the past and future having some kind of inherent existence. Actually, we can create it in our minds. So we have a bit of wiggle room here. Perception is conditioned, you know, thoughts are unreliable. So why not choose those perceptions that lead to wholesome states, that lead to, you know, developing wholesome states of mind for us? Because from there we're going to have much more opportunity to, to live a meaningful life. Sometimes people think that if we're too positive, we'll get more disappointed. You ever thought like that? I can't be too positive or... <coughs> You know, because then if it, if something goes wrong, what will happen? I'll be more more bereft. But actually, what tends to happen is that you're more resilient. Mm. And you might have remembered I spoke about that other study that was I think done in Spain, where it showed that babies that grow up in a loving environment are kind of immunized by love. I love that phrase. Immunized by love means they're more resilient. So of course they have to go through ups and downs like anyone else, but they have greater resilience, greater capacity to cope. So doing this is a protection for the mind. And lastly, almost lastly, <laughs> there are other places in the suttas where it talks about spreading loving kindness after, um, after we're wise, basically. And I think it's in the measurement number 40, it's called the Chula Asparissa Sutta, um, that the Buddha says, from virtue, uh, we develop right view. So he's actually talking about right view as an aspect of virtue, understanding a bit about suffering and non-self. And for someone like that, it's easy to develop loving kindness. And when they spread loving kindness, they can spread it in every direction. They can really spread it to all beings. And that becomes a cause of so much happiness in the world. So sometimes when people have deep insights or experiences of jhana, then it's a good time to generate loving kindness. It's one of the other things you can do with your empowered mind. You can spread loving kindness in all the directions 
very easily at that time because there is no ill will. So the difficult person is as easy as anyone else. And then one of the last um, wisdoms that we can gain from loving kindness is to actually have wisdom into the samadhi states themselves. And this is straight from the suttas. This is Majjhima number 52. And there he says that um, we basically reflect on those states of deep meditation as constructed and volitionally produced, which at first seems to go against the other sutta that said you don't achieve these things through volition. But what it really means is that um, they're still not the final goal. They're still states of mind, they're perceptions, they're um, to some extent fabricated, but less fabricated than states like ill will. States of suffering are much more built up. We actually generate them, we cultivate them, we, <laughs> uh, we impose our own kind of mood on a situation or on, on the world. So they're much more coarse. These states are much more refined, but still they're conditioned in the sense they don't last forever. They're, they're states of mind that pass away. Um, so we don't stop there, and this is why the Buddha says at that point we can have insight into things like suffering, non-self, and impermanence, impermanence of the metta, of the loving-kindness itself. So this helps us not to cling, and it helps those states to be even purer, and maybe we can see them really as, as gifts when they do arise, when we do have some metta in our mind, not to take it for granted not to get attached, not to cling, and to really feel grateful for any moment of peace because this is going to pass. And so it's seeing the practice in a wider context, seeing that, um, you know, there is a even greater happiness to be found in wisdom, even more so than in loving kindness, because it's wisdom that will uproot those unwholesome states once and for all. So this is the aim of the Buddhist path, is the wisdom. But I think metta is a very beautiful vehicle to carry with you along the way. And I just wanted to end by saying, you know, that when um, you really do see non-self, and I mean, this is sequential, so I can't claim to have seen it in its entirety, but bit by bit as you practice, you see it a little bit more deeply. And the more that you see this, the more that love can start to flow almost without a, a giver or a receiver, it just becomes a state of metta. And it doesn't really matter. It's not coming from a person, it's not coming from a self. It's something that becomes more of an abiding over time. And it's almost like anyone that comes in the range of it benefits from its warmth. And that's when loving kindness does become more and more impartial. And uh, it spreads so much more easily. It doesn't matter where it's coming from or who it's going to. It's love without a giver or a receiver. It's just love for the sake of love because it, it makes sense, because it's a wise thing to do. And that's really freeing because no one's owning it. You don't feel like, I've got so much metta. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people don't have metta or have ill will. We can't own these things. So this is really beautiful and what happens is that the whole life becomes a kind of expression of that loving kindness. Of course, nobody's perfect and we won't always be like shining with love, but generally speaking, our lives will be for the benefit of ourselves and others. And yeah, I think the kind of love that is loving kindness doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't have... Um, any demands so it becomes something very pure and very freeing and uh, yeah it becomes aligned with the way things are so we don't own the metta we don't own our meditation we just meditate for the sake of giving we just spread love and kindness for the sake of it and if other people benefit that's beautiful if not at least we do at least we can purify our hearts so I think that is enough about wisdom and love. And uh, tomorrow we will speak a bit more about how we can uh, express loving kindness in our daily lives and have a few more of the teachings of the Buddha about uh, 
situations he encountered, really, that, uh, that we probably encounter in our own lives. Yeah. Probably encounter something, very similar situations, so that can be inspiring for us going back home. So I think that is all for now. And uh, may you continue to enjoy your practice. And we'll meet back here at 7.30 for some silent meditation. Is it okay for you to be doing more silent meditation today? Is everybody feeling there's enough guidance? And Yeah. Any, anyone not? I'd love, I'd love some guidance, but I'm also happy for that to happen yeah. tomorrow if it doesn't happen today. Okay, good. So tomorrow, maybe, is it okay to say a couple of words about tomorrow? I didn't want to say it too soon, but um, there'll be a slight difference, not much of a difference, but uh, I'll give a guided meditation after lunch, and uh, we'll probably spread it to all kinds of beings. And then uh, the main difference is we'll have the talk, But then in the evening, we'll come back at 7 instead of 7.30 and we'll do half an hour of spreading metta. And this is like a kind of healing balm. It's like a closing metta that basically whatever you've experienced, whatever you've benefited from, however much or little, we share that with all beings. So we'll do that. And then at 7.30, so it'll be just half an hour, and I'll do a little bit of chanting. It's like a kind of healing metta that puts us in a good mood. So that will be all done in silence, like as usual, the afternoon will be in silence until then. And then at 7.30, we're going to, instead of the Q&A, we're going to meet upstairs, and we're going to have a fire, and some drinks, and we can sit together and just share in the way that we do in the mornings, but maybe a little bit more relaxed and spontaneous without a particular uh, structure, but still with a lot of listening and and sharing around the fire. Okay? Mm -hmm. And on the last morning, we'll have um, the morning meditation and and chant in English, I think, before breakfast. Okay? Whoever asked for that, I'm looking at Karim, but... (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure that's nice for everyone. Okay, good. But you still have a lot of time to practice with all these different uh, methods and tools and uh, just do whatever feels helpful for you. And uh, just one last last note, actually, about working with the uh, difficult person. It's not that if the meta fades, you need to stop, necessarily. It's not that if anger comes up, you're not practicing well. You are, because you're noticing... Um, your reactions and how they arise. So a little bit of that is fine. And it's only if you really feel um, that you're becoming distressed or that it's not really... um, You've had enough for that moment, for that time, that you can then drop back to an easier category. But give it some time, because it's very interesting to see where our aversions arise and... uh, Hold that in meta as well. So it's always nice to end with some loving kindness to yourself. And it's amazing if you think about it that here's a group of people who are willing to try and extend their love even to people they might not like, even people who hurt them, you know, sometimes. So, but don't stretch the plant <laughs> too much so it breaks. Just gently. Okay. Okay. You can just sit maybe quietly for a moment. <laughs> 